Good morning everyone and welcome to our latest Modern European History Preview Lecture. In today's lecture we will be looking at the situation of the Russian Empire in 1789. The Russian Empire was descended from the medieval principality of Muscovy. Muscovy, based in the city of Moscow, was one of a number of small Russian states in the medieval period and was eclipsed in status by the richer and more culturally significant cities of Novgorod in the north and Kiev to the south. At its birth, the Principality of Moscow was ruled by the Mongols who had conquered most of Russia in the 13th century. The Prince of Moscow was forced to pay regular tribute to his steppe overlords for two centuries. The Mongols, or Tartars as they were known, were defeated by Muscovy in 1480 in a great battle on the Ugra River. This victory represented the end of Mongol rule in Russia and began Muscovy's rapid ascent into becoming a great power. Muscovy became an empire under the rule of Tsar or Emperor Ivan IV, known in English as Ivan the Terrible. Ivan, who saw Muscovy as the third Rome and himself as the heirs to the emperors of Rome and Constantinople, greatly expanded Muscovy's power and size, and utterly destroyed the city of Novgorod when it tried to rebel. Ivan also instituted Russia's first secret police force, and subjected any rebellion nobles to cruel and unusual punishments, such as being dressed in bearskins and run down by a pack of wild dogs. Ivan's death saw the beginning of the Time of Troubles in Russia. The 17th century was a hard time for Muscovy, as a succession crisis and the invasion of a Polish-Lithuanian nobleman began widespread conflict. Polish-Lithuanian forces supported an emperor of their own for the imperial throne, the so-called False Dmitri, named after Ivan the Terrible's missing son. When an angry Moscow mob killed the first Dmitri, Polish-Lithuanian nobles attempted to put a second False Dmitri on the throne, but this Dmitri was not supported by the Polish-Lithuanian king, Sigismund, and lost a series of key battles against both Polish and Russian forces. Sig Sigismund was no friend of Moscow, however, and declared himself king of the empire, holding the city for two years. The high-handedness of the Polish nobility and their forces towards the Muscovites created a great enmity between the two peoples, which continues to last today. After the invading forces were driven from Moscow, the Muscovites elected a new emperor, Mikhail Romanov, to lead them. The Romanov dynasty would come to rule the Muscovite and the Russian empires until 1917, and left their mark on the country's society, culture and religion like no other family had. In the latter half of the 17th century, the balance of power in Eastern Europe began to shift away from Poland-Lithuania and towards Moscow, which greatly expanded its power. In particular, the conquest of the ancient city of Kiev in 1654 emboldened Moscow's emperors to speak for all of the Eastern Slavs. Many of the empire's new lands, in today's Ukraine and Belarus, had for centuries looked west to Catholic Poland for cultural influence. For example, the religion dominant in these lands was the Greek Catholic faith, which had split from mainstream Orthodox Christianity by agreeing a concordant with the Pope. The acquisitions of lands in Belarus and Ukraine was thus accompanied with mass forced conversion and colonization efforts. However, Moscow's new subjects also exerted a pull on the city itself. In the Muscovite Church, the cultural pool of the West was most notable in the splits that began to emerge between so-called old and new believers. The old believers lost this power struggle and were forced to flee to remote corners of the empire, which had by now consolidated its hold on the massive region of Siberia. It is in this context of struggle between old and new 
that we should consider the reign of Peter the Great, who came to the imperial throne in 1682. Peter was the first ruler to declare himself Emperor of all Russians, and his rule would help define the development of the Russian Empire over the following two centuries. Interested in Western culture and developments there from a young age, and even touring England and the Netherlands, Peter was determined to bring Russia into the cultural and technological circles he saw present in Western Europe. Peter was particularly interested in concepts of engineering and shipbuilding, areas in which he would heavily advance Russia during his reign. This reign was dominated by the so-called Great Northern War, which shifted the balance of power in northeastern Europe and the Black Sea. Peter's enemy in the war was the Kingdom of Sweden, the pre-existing power in the region. Sweden was known for its aggressive and effective army, and at first the Great Northern War went poorly for the Russians, who were utterly routed by the Swedes and their warrior king, Charles XII, at the Battle of Narva in 1700. Charles, however, then made the mistake of believing Russia to have been defeated, and made the mistake of invading Poland-Lithuania and becoming bogged down in conflict in that large country. The Russians used the following years to regain their strength and modernise their army. Serfs were now, be al were now allowed to be recruited as footmen, and were allowed to leave their masters if they did so, opening up a means of life advancement, after a short 25-year stint in the military, that is. Nobles were expected to join the ranks at age 15, and if they did so, were expected to serve for the entirety of their life. The new look Russian army obliterated the Swedes in the Battle of Poltava in present-day Ukraine, and forced King Charles into exile in the Ottoman Empire. Peter consolidated his victories over Sweden by laying the foundations for a resplendent new capital, St. Petersburg. The city was built from scratch on a swamp, chosen due to its proximity to the Baltic Sea and thus to the trade routes with Western Europe. 30,000 serfs died in constructing the city from disease in the summer and from exposure in the winter. Peter envisioned his new city as a modern European capital akin to Paris or to Vienna, and he encouraged Russian nobles to move there and take jobs in the ever-expanding imperial bureaucracy. These nobles, who were expected to leave their estates and serve for life, were known as the service nobility. Service nobles were forced to shave their beards and to adopt the latest European fashions. French, for example, was encouraged as the language of communication between one noble and another. By the latter years of Peter's rule, the army had grown to the largest in Europe, and the Russian Empire had greatly expanded in size. Indeed, throughout the 18th century, the empire would continue to take more and more lands in the east, south and the west, the areas shown here in orange. Many of the newly conquered territories were very valuable. The Baltic lands, for example, were home to a large German-speaking elite who were granted important privileges in return for service in the Russian administration. The connections of this elite with Protestant Germany also had the effect of drawing the Russians into general European conflicts for the first time, as we saw with the Seven Years' War. The massive size of the empire, however, also prohibited the level of control which the court in St. Petersburg was able to exercise over its far provinces, which remained the home of a motley collection of old believers, escaped serfs, and native people. Life for the Russian serfs who didn't escape undoubtedly got worse during Peter's reign. The emperor's attempts to standardise and rationalise stand-ins in Russian society led Peter to create a so-called table of ranks in which serfs, rather than appearing as individuals, appeared as number numbers, commodities to be moved or traded amongst nobles as they wished. A noble relocating their main residence southwards could, for example, choose to migrate to some of their serfs with them, with no respect for the serfs' pre-existing family relations. Nobles could beat their serfs, or even give them to another noble in return for political favours. 
If serfs joined the army for a better life, they would be subject, subjected to 25 years as a frontline infantry and extremely harsh rules of discipline, as well as being shut off from the rest of society in their barracks. Moreover, as more and more nobles profited with trade with the West, independent farmers and peasants fell into serfdom in ever greater numbers in order not to starve. The miserable conditions of most of the Russian population also prevented the spread of innovative agricultural techniques that were sweeping Western Europe and North America at the time. A muddled and confusing line of secession followed Peter's death, in which the nobles were able to free themselves from some of the constraints he had held upon them, once more at the expense of their serfs. Empress Elizabeth was the most competent of the mid-18th century Russian rulers, with her forces even capturing the Prussian capital Berlin for a short time. Her untimely death led to her hated nephew, Peter III, assuming the throne. Peter was hated, hated sorry, for a number of reasons. He spoke poor Russian, preferring German. He loved Prussia to the extent that he halted war with the country immediately, and he mistreated his wife, the fellow German princess, Sophie. The last of these sins would prove to be the most costly, as Sophie overthrew Peter with the aid of her lover. Empress Catherine II, as Sophie was crowned, would now rule over the Russian Empire and usher in a period many historians continue, uh, consider sorry, to be a Russian golden age. As under Peter, the empire expanded massively, this time mostly to the south and to the west. Today's Ukraine became the location for a widespread colonisation effort, with nobles being encouraged to move to the area by the state and bring their serfs with them in order to tap into Ukraine's fertile soil. After the conquest of the Crimean Peninsula, settlers were also encouraged to build and develop towns along the Black Sea coast, solidifying Russian rule there. The lands of the Ukrainian steppe had traditionally been held by migratory warriors, the Cossacks. The Russian state recruited the richest Cossacks into the ranks of the nobility, allowing them to own serfs, whilst forcing the poorer Cossacks into serfdom. In Poland Lithuania, Catherine took revenge over Russia's old enemies, at first by fixing Poland's elections to keep the country weak, and then by taking massive chunks out of the country in the first partition of 1772. Victories over the Ottoman Empire confirmed that Russia was to be the sole great power east of Prussia. Catherine earned the support of the nobility for her rule and her reforms by freeing them of many of the obligations Peter had placed upon them and allowing nobles to run their estates as they desired. This mostly entailed exploiting the serfs in a more economically efficient manner than before, and life for the serfs grew ever tougher and even more unbearable than it had been. As a result, in the 1770s, southern Russia was consumed in Russia's largest ever peasant uprising, the Pugachev Rebellion. The rebellion was led by the Cossack Pugachev, who claimed himself to be Peter III, Catherine's ex-husband. He was joined in rebellion by thousands of Cossacks, serfs and old believers, and at first enjoyed great success, capturing a number of important towns, including the historical city of Kazan. Pugachev promised the end of serfdom and liberated many serfs from the noble estates his army captured. Eventually, however, he was defeated near present-day Volgograd, taken to Moscow, and drawn and quartered in front of a public audience. To conclude, going into 1789, the Russian capital of St. Petersburg was completely different to the swampy morass that it had been at the turn of the century. A noble elite, educated in Western ways and adopting Western mannerisms, was found to be gracefully living and working in the city, in the summer months paying homage to their beloved empress. Russia was one of the mightiest nations in the world, with an empire that far eclipsed anything else in Europe, in both size and potential. Yet tensions remained. Old Russia, the Russia of Moscow, had not disappeared, it had simply been paved over. The wealth and power of the nobles 
was built upon the backs of millions of serfs who were exploited and beaten. The empire's new subjects in the west, such as the Poles, grumbled and, and dreamt of freedom. Over the 19th century, these forces would drive widespread strife in Russia. First, however, there was to be the small issue of Napoleon Bonaparte to deal with. <laughs>